So what we want you to do today is to get your Bibles. We want you to go to Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. Yeah. Um, today's sermon is entitled Broken, Broken for Love. And we come to let you know that God will allow, everybody say the word allow. Allow. Allow you to be broken, but the brokenness is not to kill you. That's right. But to make you who he created you to be. That's God. Um, if you look in Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, the prophet speaks of the state of Israel. And he says to you, some things happen, watch me, based on the interaction of some other people. Some things happen based on the interaction of the other people. He said, the day you were born, no one cut your cord. No one washed you. No one wrapped you in clothes. No one looked on you with pity. No one even had compassion enough to do anything about your present state. Listen to me. You were thrown into a open field. Watch me. And you were despised. That is how they handled you because they didn't know your worth. Come on, I'll say that again. That is how. Now, don't remember, he is sovereign. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. He allowed it to be so because he wanted you, listen carefully, to go through a season of being broken. This is not going to kill you. It's going to make you better. Is there anybody in the building that can identify that I know what it is to be in a broken state? Come on here, I need you to make sure you're around honest people. I need you to, I, come on here, just nudge them and say, I know what it is to be in a broken state. And you were there, many people were there based on what happened to you. Out of all of that, the question is, um, it didn't kill you, please listen. So where are you? Come on here. Had it happened to anybody else, they would have been dead. They would have been in a mental institution. It did not kill you. So where are you? If you look in the screen, he says in Ezekiel 16 and 6, he says, then I passed by, please listen, and I saw you kicking about in your blood you were in a puddle of blood each of us have had something happen to us that left us in a puddle ah come on here i know that we teach you to monitor your confessions i know we teach you you know to be careful what you let come out of your mouth but can we just have a mask off transparent moment and can you admit that i know what a puddle look like i know what a puddle smell like i know what it is to be in a bad situation i need you to make sure you're around other puddle survivors come on here so when we look at this we, we we all met and the question is what was the puddle that should have gotten you please listen mine was being misunderstood i remember as a kid always being told that in your mother's womb god marked you the Bible says, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Which means that you were marked and never had anything, you never had a say-so in it. He didn't, you didn't choose him. He chose you. In that being marked, you must understand you will never fit in. And everybody will have an opinion about you. You got to be careful when people don't understand you that you don't allow their words to stick to you to define who you are. So you will live your life constantly dodging daggers and negative words. Is there anybody in this building besides me that know what it is to be in a puddle of being misunderstood? understood come on here old people I'll say that's my puddle right there Anna what was your puddle 
My puddle was the puddle of um, rejection and abandonment. Um, my mother and I, I'm sure a lot of you all have heard my testimony, did not have a good relationship. Um, I was physically and verbally abused most of my childhood. And then when I became a preteen, she felt like she couldn't handle it anymore. So she sent me to my grandmother's house. Um, then I left, um, well, I was put out when I was 17. And um, I was seeking validation and acceptance. So when a guy came along that I felt validated me, I came here to Chicago. And then after we got married, and then after a year, he decided he didn't want to be married anymore. So again, I got hit with rejection again and abandonment. And I felt like, what was wrong with me that people who I loved and cared about felt that I was dispensable, that I was expendable? that when you got tired of being around me or tired of me, that you could just put me out. But I didn't understand because, you know, I didn't grow up in church, so I didn't hear the messages that you all heard. Um, so I felt like I was being put out in the trash, but I didn't know that God actually put me in a recycle bin. <laughs> What you mistake for a trash bin is really a recycle bin. You know, sometimes we see people going down the street who are homeless or just hungry, and they're going through your trash. And what we think is like, you know, I can't eat that. You know, people are like glad to have it. So thank you for being glad to have it. Cycle. It comes with a testimony. Come on! Uh, uh, Erica, what was your puddle? So, my puddle was uh, wasted time. That's my word, wasted time. And um, it was wasted time because I was in a relationship for about seven years seven and a half years. And of course you can see the man that is on the stage is not the man that I was waiting for for Shut seven up. and a half years. <laughs> and um, it was wasted time because it was one of, the, one of the best spans of time in my life. I was in my early 20s, it was very promising. I was uh, at Bethune-Cookman College, and I escalated there, got a scholarship, became queen of my school. I was in Ebony Magazine, so I was just, I was doing it, but I was wasting my time in a relationship that was not going to be fruitful. And in that relationship, I was playing wife, I was going back and forth, because it was a long distance relationship, buying stuff, believing against belief, hoping against hope, can see his potential, can see where he's going, but did he really ever truly see me? Because if he did, then he would have made sure that I was wifed up and presented in a way where I didn't look stupid. But he didn't do that, so it was my wasted time. So my pool of blood was wasted time because I felt like there, in retrospect, those were some, that was a time that I could have done some things differently. I had a little bit more energy, stuff was popping off for me, so I had different doors that I could go through, but because I was stuck on stupid, I couldn't walk through the doors that God was presenting to me because I felt like this was going to pay off. And in reality, it never did pay off. All right, Pastor Jamon, what is your puddle of blood? I think my puddle of blood is why she was going through all of that in another scenario. I was going through my own process of abandonment. And abandonment was a, it was a different word for me because I didn't really know how to approach it because in my life, I never had been abandoned. I always been accepted.
Uh, even in every relationship, I mean, this kind of swag, I mean, I had no problems. Stay humble before the Lord. Stay humble before the Lord. I had no problems. I had ev no problems Come ever on. securing a relationship. Come on. Come on. So in my early 19, when I was 19 years old, I got saved, gave my life to the Lord, a drastic shift from the world. From 19 to 26, I practiced abstinence as I began to serve the Lord as a youth pastor, 100%. And then I found a woman in the city of Chicago that I wanted to marry, do it God's way. I asked this young lady to marry me, and we got married. Uh, and when we got married, I do sincerely believe that she was in love with me as a person. But what she was not in love with was my purpose. Come on. And although, and although she knew I was living in my purpose before I married her, she thought that her love for the person could supersede the love that she needed for my purpose. But what she realized when it came to pay the price for my purpose was that purpose and the person was all one person. Come on. <laughs> And so as I started to try to work through it and navigate it because I was, uh, I, I, I did not uh, necessarily know how to handle that. When we came to the time for purpose, then she said, you know what, I do not want to continue this relationship any further. And so I was absolutely devastated. As I said, I've never been broken up uh, with. And so when she said now I was not only going to be broken up with, but we were going through a divorce, I really took that so hard in a sense of abandonment and feeling rejection. What I, what I then thought thought was the worst situation in my life I learned that it wasn't that she didn't love me it was actually that she loved me enough not to get in the way of God's assignment for my life so instead of staying connected to something that she didn't realize that she wanted to go on and do she let me go but how many of you know sometimes a let go don't feel like a high Sometimes when, you, sometimes when you feel let go, you only see what it did to you and you don't see that God was trying to turn your abandonment into an advancement. And when you learn, and when you learn, and, and so my pool, my pool of blood, my pool of blood was this laying in this season of abandonment where I had to then try to learn what God would have for me to do in that situation. That would be my pool of blood. What I love about God is that God will allow you to sit there and the enemy thinks that you're going to drown. Yeah. And some of you all, you say, well, I, I don't believe in God because I've never seen a miracle. Do me a favor. If you Touch. know that you should have died Come in on. your own puddle. But God got you out of it. Out of Do me a favor. Just touch your name and say, a miracle is touching you right here. And it actually, right well, how did you get here? God did it. God, God did, it. did it. Come on, y'all. I need you to make sure that you point them not to yep. yourself. Don't point them to your education. Don't point them to your friends or your circle God or your religion. It. But I need you to make sure that they understand that nobody did this but, but God. God, can you say that with confidence? Come on here. Tap your own self and say, God, God did, it. did this. God did it. God did it. So now Pastor Jamon is going to walk you through. We're going to walk you through very quickly eight things that God did. Did. So we see here in the book of Ezekiel, verse 6 through 14, very strategically, that God never lets you go through pain without purpose. And so anytime you go through pain without purpose, he never puts you in pain to leave you there. He has a message and a method to the madness. And so we see God coming to Israel, verse 6 through 14. There are eight things that God does for broken people to get them ready for love. The first thing it says is that he saw, verse 6 says, as then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your own blood and as you lay there in your blood somebody say he saw me he saw me the first thing God does when he get when you're in a situation is he does not ignore you he sees you he sees it's an uncomfortable place he sees it's an un it's a place that you didn't expect to be in you ought to thank God for being able to see you and not leave you like he found you 
So after he sees you, he does something very powerful. He immediately speaks a word over you. Yes, God. Because he understands that the words that come out of his mouth cannot return unto him void. I'm so glad that God prophesied rather than man prophesied yes, over you. If you look at the screen, it says in Ezekiel 6, he said, I said to you, live with an exclamation point which means that you don't even have a choice in the matter some of y'all wanted to kill yourself wanted to go crazy but God spoke over you and his words could not return unto your void and you are alive in another decade because God spoke over you and told you to live so first he saw you and then he spoke to you let's go after he spoke to you verse 8 he acknowledges you somebody say acknowledge it says later I passed by and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love I saw you I spoke a word over you and then I came back to check on you to see if you laid hold to what I said to you anybody in here glad that when God speaks to you he don't forget what he told you but then he acknowledges you to make sure that you grew up through the process. Look at your neighbor and say, it pained me, but I grew up through it. Come on, tell somebody, it pained me, but I'm mature now. Had I known then what I know now, I don't even cry over what I used to cry about for, because now I know that it's better for me that I have been afflicted because he acknowledges me. He acknowledges me. Come on, open your mouth, everybody say, he saw me. He saw me. He spoke to me. He spoke to me. He acknowledged me. He acknowledged And the next thing he does is that he covers you. He covers Don't you. forget, I found you and I saw you in an open field. Yeah. You didn't have anything on, watch me. And I'm gonna make sure that I cover you to calm you down. Yeah. I'm gonna make sure that I put you in a place called peace. Yeah. I'm gonna put you in a place called comfort. I am going to cover you. Watch me, because I have the ability to cover you. Man couldn't cover you. Come woman on. couldn't cover you. People couldn't cover you. But I don't know about you, but I would rather have the covering of man, of God, than the covering of man. Why? Because you might get mad at me and take your covers Come back. On. But God, he says, lo, I am with you always. He said, I spread, I spread, I spread. Let me show you how powerful I am. I spread, he said, I spread the corner of my garment over you and I covered, watch your me, your naked body. body. I covered you from being embarrassed. I covered you from being shamed. I covered you that people can't talk about you. I cover you, as a matter of fact, I'm going to cover your name too. You will live a scandal-free life. Come on. They should have killed you when they, when they birthed you, but I'm going to make sure I cover you from now until eternity. Touch the one on your right and your left and tell them, you're covered. 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 You ought to clap two hands together and give God a praise for covering me. Come on. Ah, he covered me so well that you didn't even know I went through all that. I look so much better than I look than I what I went through. You didn't even know that I went through hell last year. That's how good God just covered me. Somebody shout and give God a. Sit down. Verse 8, sit down. Verse 8, rest your wig. Sit down. Verse 8, verse 8, after he covers you, the next thing he do is he makes a promise to you. Verse 8, and I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. You became mine. God says, I'm going to make sense out of the nonsense. 
presence. I'm going to turn your pain into purpose. Because every problem that you experienced, I was just trying to make you a promise. And can I let somebody know in here that God's promise is bigger than your pain and your problem. And when you find a problem, you better go find a promise for your problem and let your problem know that your promise is bigger than your problem and your God is stronger. He only lets you go through problems so he can make you a promise. I need you to get one praise partner and tell him he made me a promise. He made me a promise. I went bankrupt through that situation. But then he said he is the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills and I shall lend and not borrow. I got put out on that situation. Then he said he is my shelter in a time of struggle and need. I thought my heart was broken. But then he told me that he's the lover of my soul. So I went through hell, but I'm better. Come on, open your mouth. Say, he saw me. He saw me. He spoke over me. He He acknowledged me. He He covered me. He covered me. And he promised me. And And the next thing he did, I need you to pay attention. What did he do? He literally cleaned you up. Come on. I bathed you with water and I washed the blood from From you. When I washed you, I erased the fingerprints of the enemy off of you when I clean you you will only know you used to be in blood if you tell them you will oh watch me watch me they will only know that you were in that bad of a state if you tell them because I'm gonna make sure that I wash you fairly things that killed everybody else you alive you don't even look like you got molested you don't even look like you got abused you don't even look like you got a bad clean why because he washed me hey on your way to your seat, touch the name and say, He washed me. He washed me. He washed me. He washed me. You have no idea the kind of mess I used to have on me. me. I had generational curses Wash. and bloodline curses. Wash. He gave me a blood transfusion. Come on, Pastor Javon. After I get clean, what he do next? After he cleaned you up, then he dressed you up. Come on here. Look at somebody say, he didn't leave me clean and naked, but he dressed me up. Look at it. Verse 10, 11, 12, 13. Come on, let's read it. He then, after he cleaned you, he clothed you with an embroidered dress. Ah, oh, this nice. <laughs> and then sandals and fine leather on you. Mm-hmm. And dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. Come on. Look at somebody say, this cost me something. This cost me. He adorned you with jewelry. Come on. He put bracelets on your arms. Talk. A necklace around your neck. Come on. He put a ring on your finger. Shut up. He put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ear. Come on. And a beautiful crown on your head. Shut up. What did he do? He just took me from raggedy and ratchet to royalty. I need you to tell somebody I used to be raggedy and maybe a little bit ratchet, but now I am royalty. You're going to see the king in me. You're going to see the queen in me. You might as well get used to it because I ain't getting up off my throne. I know who I am now. You could have dated me when I didn't know better, but now I know better now. You could have hollered at me. You actually should have shot your shot, but now it ain't no time for that. You either come correct or get to stepping because I don't need you to take me on no trips. I get my own trips. This is too much up in here. I can only imagine what's going on at West Side in Bronzeville and in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids probably going bananas. Come on, everybody, open your mouth. Say he saw me. He spoke to me. 
He acknowledged me. He covered me. He promised me. He, promised he cleaned me. me. He dressed me. He dressed uh oh, and then he fed me. Come on. Because watch me, I didn't have the strength to get up. But the moment that he fed me, he gave me the strength to walk out of whatever I was in. He didn't send anybody to get me out because they would have taken the credit. But God, watch me, his strength became perfect in, in my, my weakness. weakness. So just when I thought I was about to die, he, he come again and got me out of the hell I was in. I need to hear what an exit praise sound like. <laughs> I got you with honey and olive oil and find this food. Bring that list back up. Bring that Bring list back up. Bring that list Bring back up. Come on, everybody say, he saw me. He, saw me. he spoke a word he over, spoke me. over me. He acknowledged me. He, acknowledged he covered me. me. He, he promised me. me. He cleaned me. He, cleaned he dressed me. me. He dressed and then he fed and me. He, fed he saw me. He spoke you over me. Testify. He acknowledged me. He covered what me. He, he promised what me. He, he cleaned me. What he he dressed me. What he and do? then he fed what me. He, he saw me. What he, he spoke a word over me. He acknowledged me. He covered me. What did he, he do? promised me. What did he, he cleaned me. What did he, he fed me. What did he I do? Run back up. What he do? saw me. What he do? spoke a word over me. He acknowledged me. What he do? covered me. What he he promised me. He cleaned me. He dressed me. And then he fed me. That's why I don't let you determine my praise. Because when I think oh, of the goodness of he Jesus, did all, that, all, and all that. he's done he did for all me, that. I need you to shut every demon up that's been in your ear and in your spirit. I need you to release the praise like he saw you. Come on. He spoke a word over you. Come on. He acknowledged you. He, he covered up. you. He, he promised you. He cleaned you. He dressed you. And he then he fed you. On the count of three, your praise match what he did. One, two, three. Go. What he do? What he do? What he do? What do you do? What do you do? You are the temple. Check that. You are the temple. Up in here. Son of a bitch. Oh, glory to God. Come on. Come on. Glory to God. Come on. You sit next to somebody that ain't there yet. Get them up and say, Come on, get there. Get there. Get there. You, I wouldn't sit another moment in a sad state. I would get myself up, dust myself off, and declare that everything God did for somebody Come else, on. He got to do it for me. Your turn. Your turn. Your turn. Your turn. That's what God got you in the building today. You were supposed to die in the last decade, but God brought you into a new decade. Come on. Come on on your way to your seat, touch the people and say, your turn. Your turn. Stop. Let's Focus. go. Acknowledge. Come. Have a seat. Promise. Clean. Yay. Dress. Peg. Song. Yeah, my shy, my son. He saw me. Spoke. Come on, y'all. Have a seat. Acknowledged. Have a seat. Covered. Promise. Clean, dressed to God, be the glory. Praise, praise to God. Come on. What do you do? 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 What do you do?
Sit down, y'all, sit please. Down. You had to. On your way to your seat, say, I wasn't supposed to be here, but I made it. Woo! Out of all the things that I've been through. What are we doing? What are you doing? What are we doing? <laughs> Out of all the things that I've been through. What are you doing? Out of all the things that I've been through. Out of all the things that I've been through. Come on. Sit down, sit down. Come on, y'all, we got, we got 12 minutes. Sit down. Every campus, <laughs> sit down. It's too much. Every campus. I got to praise, I got to praise, and I got to get it out. What? For real, we're gonna stop. Everybody sit down. Come on, Jamal. Sit down. Sit down, man. Sit down. Come sit on, we're gonna sit down. Sit down. Please sit down. Sit down. Sit Can y'all please sit down? Because we gotta get somebody out of their puddle. Down. No soldier left behind. <laughs> sit down. Sit down. Sit down.
worship God for 10 seconds. Come on, West Side. Come on, Grand Rapids. Come on, Bronxville. Come on, give God your worship. Open your mouth. Worship him like he saw you. Worship like he spoke to you. Worship like he acknowledged you. Nobody did it but God. Nobody did it but God. Say my mind. How did you get out? How did you get out? How did you exit? God did it. How did you make it out? God did it. Because he said that he would give you a way of escape. Of escape. Yes, sir. How Woo! did you get out come on y'all we got like 10 minutes to do this and I, I want to slow it down right here because there's some of you are we up here doing all this jumping and shouting and running somebody can't jump and you still in your puddle so allow us just to slow it down and very briefly so when we were studying this we asked the question um, out of these eight, what was the one that you could say was your personal testimony? Like, what was the one thing that you could look at and say, this was my word out of the eight that we gave you? And Pastor Jamon, what was yours? I think, Pastor, after I had gone through the traumatic experience, I didn't respond in a shout like we just did. It took time to get there. Come on. Some stuff you can't shout your way out of. You got to process your way through. Come on. I think what happened was I tried to quit, Pastor. Come on. I give it God my, my 20s. I give it to my life. I got married. I did it his way. And it didn't seem like it worked out. It threw me in a sense of abandonment. I tried to push back from everything. I didn't want to do ministry anymore. I quit doing ministry. I went and got me a job at National Teachers Academy became a teacher. I got an opportunity while I was teaching there to be raised, a promotion. I was rising to the top. And then her grandfather, Bishop William C. Abney, called me. He called me and asked me to come to Grand Rapids to preach for him. I came there. You can't tell Bishop Abney no. So I didn't want to, but I had to obey. I went and I came to preach. And then he asked me to come back once a month. When I came back once a month, he asked me to move from Chicago to Grand Rapids to be his executive pastor. When I got there, I surrendered my, my life to God and to him, and I pulled out of that part. When I thought that I was invisible and I tried to hide, my word would be that God saw me. Because he saw me and he said, in spite of your failure and your problem, you still have worth. And I still want to use you. And I'll never forget when Bishop Abney asked me to come there. He said, he said, listen, I'm sure that you're matriculating up through education and everything is great. But it will be a shame for you to be stuck in a classroom and the world never get to meet a Jermon Glenn. He said, I need you to come here and take this, your calling, seriously. I asked him if he could match my paycheck. He said, I could not match your paycheck. He said, but if you do not take the paycheck, you'll never want for anything in your life. I had to make a decision in the middle of pain if I would choose a paycheck or purpose. How many of you know purpose pays more than a paycheck? I let go of the paycheck and I moved in purpose. Little did I know I thought I was just moving there for a job but God had been processing this fine lady through a whole nother situation and not only did I get a job in purpose but I got a partner in purpose and I married the bishop's granddaughter. Hallelujah. Not only did he see me, God saw me, he saw me, she saw me. Seeing me God being able to see me was my turning point. All right. Anna, what was the one word that you could say, this was the one, this was my exit? Out of the eight words, which word did you grab? Um, last night when we were meeting, mm -hmm. he tried to give me my word. I tried to. I tried to give her a word. I wanted my own word. I picked my own word. And my word is acknowledged. God acknowledged my pain. Um, because when I was going through all that, I tried to talk to people about how I felt about things. 
and how um, rejected and abandoned I felt and how devastated I felt. And um, when I was looking at this box earlier, I felt like, this is how I felt. I felt like I was in a box. I was depressed and I couldn't get out of that depression. And then I had no peace. I had no peace and I had no hope while I was in that situation. I didn't know anybody that could get me out of it. I didn't. And God validated me when I finally stopped fighting him. Because I wanted to do it my way. I wanted what I wanted and how I wanted it. And I was going to fight until I got it. And because I had no peace, I couldn't sleep at night. I stayed up. I had insomnia. And anybody who knows me, I can fall asleep at the drop of a hat. In a minute. In a minute. When I'm tired, I can sleep. But I couldn't sleep. And then, no, I wasn't taught the word of God growing up. But the word is so true. He said the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. I didn't know that God had taken my the stuff that was going through my mind, what the enemy was trying to tell me about myself. He was trying to tell me, you're not lovable, you're not worthy, nobody will ever want you again. You know, you're, you're trash, you're this, you're that. You know, and one time I remember I was standing on the CTA tracks coming home from work and I heard just jump on the tracks. Mm. But something snapped me back and said, don't do it. Don't do it. So the fact that God acknowledged me and my worth and validated me, regardless of what anybody may think or say about you, I know what God says about me. Come on, girl. So he acknowledged me. Yeah. Erica, out of the eight words, which is the word that you would say was your exit? Um, my exit word is clean. Um, I chose this word because while I was going through all of that and I graduated from college, um, the Lord placed me back. He put me in my grandparents' home and I had to live with them uh, because they were older. It was a nice house, but I was just like, Lord, why I got to live with the old people? I don't understand that. And every time I tried to find a place to live, he shut it down. And there was no reason for me not to be able to find my own place to live. But I didn't know in that moment that God was keeping me. He was protecting me. And so with with that whole relationship and realizing that it wasn't going to really progress into anything and that I really needed to take my life back because I had a piece of my life, but I didn't have all of my life. I didn't have all of my emotions. I didn't have my love. I didn't have my uh, sanctity. I didn't have all of the things that were precious that I would need to give to a man. I didn't have it because he had it. And so the Lord was like, what you going to do? He's like, you need to get clean. So I remember being in my room and just having a temper tantrum, just, just mad at God, just like, why am I going through all of this? And he's like, I need you to be clean because I need to take you to some places, but the way that you are, you can't go there because I need you to be an example. And I was like, okay, so what exactly, what does that mean? He was like, I need you to be an example, so I need you to get your sexuality together. I need you to stop sleeping around. I need you to get your mind together. I need it to be focused on me. I need you to get your heart together and give it back to me. I need you to give your soul back to me. I need you to give everything that you gave him back to me. And just like you went hard for his purpose and you went hard for what I promised him, I want you to go hard for me. Every ounce of energy and love and affection that you gave him, I want you to give it to me. And we cliche, we cliche say this when we're single, but God is like, I need to be your man. Because you done been in a whole bunch of relationships as long as you know it to be. But I need you to be in a place where you're whole 
and no one has your emotions but me. So I started going through this process and I just started trying to get myself together, reading my word, just fasting and praying, all of the stuff that I knew what to do, I just wasn't doing it. And then when I wholeheartedly gave him everything, then he pushed me and he was like, now I can put you before people. And I'm like, okay, I sing already. He was like, no, I need you to worship. I need you to bring, I need you to lead people to worship. And the only way you can do that is if you're clean. Because when you grab that microphone and you leading people to worship, they're open. And I can't have you being dirty and you're leading people into my presence and then you pollute them. Can't have you do it. So get your life together, get your heart right, and stay saved to me, unto me. So he did all of that. And I worshiped him. And I worshiped him in a way that I didn't even really see myself anymore and the more that I worship the more doors that he opened and the more that I worship the more he starts showing me my purpose yeah. and the more that I worship the more that he start bringing people in my life the more that I worship he start opening doors where the stage that he said that I was going to be on I sung background for Bishop Marvin sat for a long time because my worship and I did the work with him I wasn't always perfect but my heart was tender toward him and I wanted to please him I wanted to please him with all of my life, with everything that was inside of me. I didn't want anything that would displease him. So my word is clean. Lift your hands. Everybody lift your hands and begin to worship God right there. Come on, I don't care where you are in life. If you feel like you're stuck, if you feel like you're in a puddle, I need you to begin to worship God. And I, cho I chose the word dress because I know that he gave me the garment of praise yeah. I know that he wrapped me up in prayer and gave me worship and there's some of you all that are in this building right now and I need you to hear me you feel like you're in a mess but the Lord has sent a word to you today I see you I speak to you even in your messy situation I acknowledge you, I cover you, and after I cover you, I clean you, and after I clean you, I dress you, and after I dress you, I feed you, because I believe in you. Can you do me a favor, not worship man, can you lift your hands and worship the God that believes in you? Erica, there's a song right here that I'm gonna need you to just sing unto the Lord. Come on, everybody, forget about everybody in this building. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Come on, stand up where Just you are. Want to tell Come you, on, stand up where you are. Lord, I love you more than anything. Come on, you don't have to wait on her to sing the song. You know the song. Everybody open your mouth and sing it unto the Lord. I love you, Jesus. Come and get and I me. Worship, I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you. Just want to tell you. That I love you. Lord, I love you. More than anything. Oh, oh, oh. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come on, you say it. And I worship it. What's going on?
say this? <laughs>